What's up, humans? Welcome to a new Psicoactivo. This is round three of Professor Matt Laszlo, the yeah, founder yeah. of Askapol. How you doing, Matt? Welcome back to the yeah. show, man. Got my pulse. That's all I can ask for. Yeah, man. How, how's it been over there? Like, it's it was a little bit quiet for a while, and suddenly over yeah. the last couple of weeks, you got like a couple of great exclusives with uh burleson and another one with rounds how'd that come about and uh what what's the reaction been like with those two well just like for our audience at ask a poll i have to apologize because the american congress is really shitty at congressing oh like, yeah they're they had to cancel their last week when they were supposed to be in session just because it was such a shit show in the house like republicans fighting republicans so once they canceled that week and started their annual month-long August recess, the American Congress is only going to be in session three weeks between the end of July and November because they're taking all of October off, um, which some people are like, all right, that's good, so they can't mess anything up. But folks like our community who actually care about policy, it kind of does screw us Um but I'm also curious with the UAP UFO issue, because it's been so nonpartisan, not even bipartisan, just nonpartisan for the most part. That's where I think there is a little bit of sunlight. And from what lawmakers are uh, telling me, it looks like we might have some hearings. Um, Congresswoman Luna, Anna Paulina Luna, one of the co-chairs of the UAP caucus, she told me in one of their last weeks here that... Um, the house is like hundred percent according to her. She's like, yep, we're going to have a hearing. She said, it's going to be chaired by a female um, and not by Congressman Grothman this time. And looking at all the subcommittee chairs on oversight, it looks like it might be Nancy Mace chairing that hearing. We'll okay. see. But she, that makes she's sense. Been and she's been active on the UAP issue. Yeah. So it could have a different tone. And Luna's also told us instead of, UAPs, they want to look at USOs, so the yeah. underwater stuff. It doesn't seem like it's going to be 100% focused on USOs, but that's going to be a big part of it. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. It's intriguing um, because then Senator Gillibrand, you know, other side of the Capitol, because the House is a different universe than um, the Senate. Gillibrand's told me all summer that she plans to have a hearing, or she's talked to Arrow. She said Arrow agreed to come to a public hearing where she wants them to explain um, their methodology and stuff. Cause she's like, there's so much skepticism about the stuff that they're saying they identified. So she wants them to go through and explain it to the public. But then she also wants them to explain the stuff that they can't see. Cause like, this is the funniest thing about this issue. You have like these skeptics be like, look, Arrow, they know like 80, 90% of the stuff. Like, come on, no issue. I'm like, cool. We don't care about the 80, 90 <laughs> percent. We're talking about the 10 percent, you know. <laughs> and so like the stuff that they literally can't identify, that's what we're intrigued about. And so I'm in interested to see what Arrow presents to us. You know, like we're all rightfully skeptics, especially of Congress. And so and of Arrow. So and I know lawmakers are, too. So that could be interesting. And so Gillibrand said either July or September. Well, July came and went. I didn't yeah. get an interview her before they started their recess in the Senate. So according to what she told me last, when the Senate comes back in September, either then or October, we should be getting a public UAP hearing in the Senate. Again, it's an election year. And so I can really imagine them coming back and gaveling out or just doing BS, hyperpartisan messaging bills in both chambers. But again, because this issue is so nonpartisan, um, this might be one of the few issues where leadership's like, yeah, do a hearing. We'd rather people be focused on uh, Congress doing an investigation into something where you all are kind of united, as opposed to like having more Republican on Republican violence in the House, where like Republicans are derailing Republicans' agenda um which to me is glorious have you not noticed that uh because we've been talking about this christian and i that 
with the election uh, coming closer, a lot of this uh, uh, politicians from both aisles have gotten a little bit partisan uh, on their oh, yeah. like public posts and everything. And they've been yeah. criticized for it uh, by the UFO community quite a bit. Uh, what's your read on that? What do you think about what's happening there? Well, so it's been interesting because again, it's been in it's been funny for me watching some people from the outside kind of try to like insert politics into the issue. Like, remember that uh, Adam Kissinger? He was on the January. He was one of the two Republicans. Him and Liz Cheney were the two Republican, like never Trumpers, on the January sixth committee. Well, like he tried to like dunk on the UAP issue by dunking on the UAP caucus being like, look, a lot of these people in the UAP caucus, like they're freedom caucus folks, you know, the furthest right uh, people in the house, there's like bomb throwers, they're the, like Burchett and um, Nancy Mace and Luna was kind of a part of it, but they, or not Luna, but Nancy Mace and Burchett, they were two of the eight votes to house uh, Speaker McCarthy, you know, so that brought chaos from Republicans and Republicans control the House. And so when Adam Kissinger or whatever people were looking, they're like, look, these are the far right folks. I'm like, all right, so you're talking about Burchett, Luna. But don't forget when they, when I've like sat outside of the skiff, some of the lawmakers, especially in the second skiff briefing this year, when more Garcia, came, right? Well, no. So we had, yes, Garcia, but we also had AOC. In there, we had Congressman Jamie Raskin, who's the top Democrat on oversight. He was also one of Trump's impeachment managers. And so the fact that he cares about the issue, um, along with these people from the far right, does show that this issue is nonpartisan, which makes it like very rare in a hyperpartisan Congress. But like you were saying, because it's now an election year and because Democrats in the house or just like the minority party in the house just the way it's set up they have no power like in the senate you have the filibuster so every senator is really powerful and really matters in the house uh when you're the minority party like you're just screaming at the wind and that's what they do they scream a lot and in the wind which these days means on social media um so that's where it was interesting seeing garcia kind of insert a little bit of partisanship into it which then was like I guess Republicans kind of like hit him away a little bit, but like he also did it in a policy way. So he introduced the Schumer's UAP DA amendment in the house to try to attach it to the NDAA. That wasn't from what I know and what I see. And I've been covering this stuff 18 years. That to me wasn't a serious legislative effort, even though like these days PR is policy. And so maybe it was, and he could make an argument that it was, but I'm going to argue, this is Professor Laszlo, that it was, you know, him playing partisan politics and whatever, he raised the issue, you know, he got it talked about because no one was really talking about the UAPDA because it seems like this year's National Defense Authorization Act or NDAA, it seems like once again, it's going to be crafted behind closed doors by party leaders. So it, some can say, some or Garcia could say, look, I elevated the issue. I got it talked about and I wanted to offer it as an amendment. If he really wanted it to be an amendment offered, he likely would have talked to one of the co-chairs of the UAP caucus because they are in the majority party and because some of them did oust Speaker McCarthy. So Speaker Johnson's kind of terrified of them. He won't admit it publicly. But so that's where... Again, Garcia would say, no, it was a serious policy move. I care about it. But again, it smelled like politics. And after that happened, the House kind of did quickly move on past it. And like maybe that's why Luna and the others are now like, yeah, we're going to have a UAP hearing. Maybe Garcia is the one who forced them because they're the majority party, so they get to decide hearings and stuff. So maybe Garcia's uh, political ploy worked. But yeah. I think it's been good for the issue to stay away from the hyperpartisan BS uh, yeah. in this town. You know, everything. especially like right America, now, <laughs> dude. America these days, it's gross. Like, yeah, 
book bans, so like books and literature has become political. Uh, brunches, <laughs> you know, drag queen brunches, they're now political. Uh, everything, like sports, you know, after the BLM movement, it's like everything these partisan hacks try to like make political. And what I want to do is remind people, no, politics or policy is supposed to be people. And so these politicians, yeah, they're great at selling fear, but all they're doing is raising money off the fear that they're selling. Like, no, force them back to policy. Just um, yesterday, psychedelic therapy took a hit, right? I did that was, see that. FDA? Yeah, that was awful. And that's also uh, politicized heavily. Dude, but that's also an interesting one because that, for folks who don't know, this is like uh, psychedelic assisted therapy stuff. So like psilocybin, the stuff in mushrooms, like they've been using that. And here in Washington, D.C., we uh, we didn't legalize shrooms, but voters via a referendum a couple years back, they literally voted to make it like the least... Um, what did they do? So they didn't decriminalize it, but they made it so if officers come and like see you with a pound of shrooms, but they also see a broken window, they legally have to go and deal with like the broken window. <laughs> you know, like it's totally been deprioritized. And like yeah. the taxpayers said, we just like want the politics out of it, which to me, I'm like a little terrified by that because I'm like, the last thing we need is Matt Gates eating a fucking eighth of shrooms and ruining it for all of us you know oh man dude dude <laughs> i have i have like i've been talking about this with my mates from high school that if all politicians got like a horror trip dose everything would change like overnight many of them would like quit politics altogether <laughs> right <laughs> yeah they'd see through their own bullshit one would hope yeah. uh, so that's been interesting and again, AOC and uh, Congressman Dan Crenshaw, a veteran, they've been kind of leading on that. And when AOC first got here to Congress back in 2018, I believe, like the squad was just becoming the squad, she put it up as an amendment uh, and everyone kind of laughed at her. Well, then all these lawmakers started getting calls. Their offices were like, wait, why did you oppose that? Like, you know, my uh, son who's a veteran or my husband who's a veteran or my wife who's a veteran. They could really use that. And um, so the next time it came up, she like doubled the amount of votes. And so instead of people like rolling their eyes at it, people then like took it seriously and looked into it. So I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins, our master's program here in DC, our government public policy program. I need to get myself to Baltimore where I guess Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, like our main campus, we've got like the world's leading like psilocybin center. I think it's funded with like, a billion maybe 50 million maybe 500 million bucks but they've been doing such cutting edge research um and that's where lawmakers are still stuck in this stupid war on drugs mindset like oh lock everyone up when it's like wait the stuff that you all declared as drugs while like oxycontin you all pedal and allow pharma to pedal all this crap that gets us addicted and leads to this opioid crisis Actually, some of the stuff you were calling drugs might actually be medicine to a lot of people. And like even with cannabis, so I used to cover drug policy for Rolling Stone, Playboy, Vice, Vice News Tonight. One of my Rolling Stone pieces leads with like I wasn't I gave the guy um, an anonymity because he's a federal worker who uses cannabis. So he risks losing his job every day. But yeah, he starts with like this guy. He's in a wheelchair because he lost both of his legs in Afghanistan, lost fingers on one hand, just like totally maimed in a um, you know roadside bomb over there, IED. What he tells me in that piece is that he would rather be blown up again in Afghanistan than go through opioid withdrawal again. And yeah. he's maimed. He needs help. He gets that through cannabis. And so yeah. literally... And I asked him again, and you, you could, he paused when I was interviewing him, and he thought about it. And he was like, yeah, I'd rather be blown up again. And then I asked him again. I'm like, really? And he waited eight seconds. He's like, yeah, I would literally rather get blown up again. 
to go through opioid withdrawal. That's the thing is that they, they don't realize that this withdrawal from opioids gives you like 10 times the PTSD you have from uh, any uh, yep. traumatic experience. So it's, and then, I don't and know then why they get, decide that. But then you can't get more Oxycontin easily, but you can easily get fucking heroin. Um, and that's where it's bullshit. Oh, it's over there. But so I actually just started buying, I'm giving them out to all my friends, but little uh, test strips for fentanyl. Literally, everyone should have them. Like, the whole idea, like, just say no. Cool, that's what my parents told me before I became a raging homeless cokehead <laughs> at 18, <laughs> you know? And it's like, no, the war on drugs, like, the just say no, that's bullshit. What do we have now? Um, well, for one, we should have better studies and research because, guys, marijuana, psilocybin, that's not for everyone. Like, I'm, it's worked for me. I'm everyone's different and so this is where you all need to like go out talk to experts or whatever feel it out very slowly for yourselves but that's where just this broad prohibitions were so dumb like i also have like narcan oh he's in my bag i just bought another thing of narcan for the capital because i'm just gonna have it like i started a little library in the press gallery senate radio tv gallery so i'm gonna put narcan up on top because people are like wait, that's a them problem. Like, who? what do you mean? No one's overdosing in the Capitol until they do. Yeah. Now, we don't know of an overdose yet, but oh my God, there are so many drugs done on Capitol Hill. Like oh, there yeah. are literally pharmacists who for some of these big um, political groups, the pharmacist comes in and just writes them scripts for whatever they want. And those pharmacists are on retainer. 10,000 bucks a month just to come in and write scripts for whatever they want. So, like, it's not an us versus them thing. Guys, we're Americans. We all fucking love drugs. Like, that is what the war on drugs proved. <laughs> yeah. And as long as we got pharma or pharma peddling this shit for free or, you know, making billions off it, but the whole system um, is just stacked against us. And that's where it is exciting seeing some of that stuff being challenged. Um, again, and kind of you have the bullshit partisanship, but Joe Biden is that old school, just say no mindset. Um, yeah, I think his brother struggled with alcoholism or maybe his dad. So he's just like never touched alcohol and has always been opposed to substances like cannabis and that. The party's kind of pulled him a little bit and moved him on that issue. Not totally. Um, but even seeing Trump's press conference on uh, Thursday, I believe, Trump was asked about it. And Trump, while well, he was like, yeah, I'm not really, you know, he's like threatened to like kill. Uh, he's threatened to do a Duterte and like kill uh, drug dealers, you know, which sends shivers down my spine because I've been a drug dealer in my past. And my good friends were drug dealers. Um, dot, dot, dot. So, but Trump, he was like, yeah he was asked about marijuana rescheduling and he was like and it was so kind of beautiful because he was just thinking it through and he's like well yeah it doesn't make sense for people to be in jail for what's legal out here a yeah. fucking men amen yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know and like take the partisanship out of it like good job trump like you recognize the humanity and the stupidity of the fact that i can grow and i have grown my own marijuana just right out in back of my crib there are people locked up in jail like two and a half miles, like my neighbors locked up two and a half miles away for something that I can now grow legally. And that's just yeah. insane. Insane. Yeah. Makes no sense. And it's kind of, I, I don't know, I get I get a little hopeful when I see issues like this and the UAP uh, getting yeah. nonpartisanship. That's that's really right. cool. It's it's wild in these times, too, because because of the election year. Uh but yeah, I, I really love what you're doing on Ask a Pole Drugs, man. Uh, as you know, the, the channel is called Psicoactivo. I started talking, the first topic ever I started talking about was this. And I do have like a like a 10-step uh, guide on which uh, uh, aspects of getting into substances are the most dangerous ones so yeah. you can avoid them. And I do nice. love... I do love what you're doing over there, man. So kudos to you. Uh, I wanted to see if we can. Well, dude, so real, real quick on that. If y'all yeah. remember, 
last summer after David Grush dropped his bombshell. You know, for people who don't know, he's the UFO whistleblower who did the public hearing last uh, July. Well, once he came out with his thing, I think early June or maybe late May, I was like, wait, this guy just gave a middle finger to the entire Congress saying like, you all are being lied to. There is shit that is hidden from you. And for me, I'm a constitutional junkie. So I was like, wait, like, Grush had two claims. First claim is that there's like recovered crafts. And I'm like, all right, that can be proven or disproven. You know, it's either physically there or it's not. So, but his second claim was um, that there are these hidden SAPs or special access programs that are ultimately funded by Congress because all funding has to come through Congress, but that is funded by Congress, but hidden from Congress, that they don't know about these programs. And so that's a middle finger to every lawmaker. Like if you are in this Congress and you have a whistleblower who's been vetted, you know, who comes and testifies before Congress and everyone bipartisan is like, yeah, you seem thousand percent credible, uh, you know, um, so he's trusted, believed across all ideologies. Um, and then you, uh, yeah, for this Congress, like, even though some of them have like rolled their eyes at Grush or some have like wanted to tamp it down, like not have that public conversation, he came out publicly and said, Congress, you are allowing the federal government, you know, the executive branch apparatus to lie to your face. And this Congress has not disproven Grush. So it's either like prove him false or let's deal with the reality that he's described that there are programs hidden from you all. And that's extra constitutional. Like that is outside the bounds of our constitution, which makes every one of these members of Congress an utter failure unless they either disprove him or yeah, give a little oxygen and maybe take him a little more seriously. And it's, and it's been a year already and he's not in jail. Nobody, nobody has sued him for anything. So what's happening? You know, uh, well, I wanted to ask so you about that. that. I was going to say, so with yeah. that, last year, I interviewed all 100 senators about David Grush. You can find that at askapoll.com. It's actually like pinned to the top of our UAP page. Also, this summer, after the DEA started moving on rescheduling, like examining it, I interviewed all 100 senators on cannabis and like specifically the Safer Banking Act, which like, it uh, gets wonky, but it's a ma marijuana measure that like allows all cash businesses now to become you know part of the banking system and stuff. The beautiful thing about Ask a Poll is like you all in our community send me questions and like issues that lawmakers think they don't have to talk about. UAPs, uh, MDMA, cannabis. No, because of us, they have to talk about them, you know, oh, yeah. or at least they get confronted with it. Some are like, wait, I haven't heard of that. So part of it, I'm going, Ask a Poll's going and breaking news to these lawmakers because they just live in their own stupid silos. Um, yeah, breaking news and, and breaking the stigma, man. That's what you're helping at. Right. And it's so fucking important, man. Uh, so important on both issues, the substances and UAP. But I think that with substances, uh, They've gone through a similar path historically to UAP, and but that that stigma was more uh, strengthened in the '60s when it all went down, you know. And yeah. it's it's been like that. It's been misinformation campaigns. It's been uh, multiple talk shows demonizing everything about substances, uh, lumping them on the same boat. Every single yeah. one of them which is a big ass mistake. Like you cannot right? put psychedelics and opioids in the same boat. That's stupid. Right? <laughs> it's literally insane. The fact that like, what schedule one, like crack cocaine is the same as like LSD and marijuana. What the fuck is that? Like, really? Like I've gotten really high in my life and I've eaten a lot of stuff. Like, I got the munchies, you know, like, guys, come on. Um, Makes no sense. Again, again, I don't recommend getting super, super high and obviously don't drive and stuff. But like, guys, it's a pretty tame 
fucking drug if we're even going to call it that anymore. I mean, let's really talk about the problem. Diet fucking Coke. We, oh, we yeah. have an obesity problem in America. Like hundreds of thousands of us are dying from our sugar like, in general. Shitty diets and sugar. Like we're addicts. Um, but some are legal addicts, you know, and like the American government, we subsidize the um, like our taxpayer dollars go to subsidize the American sugar industry, which is like gets long and convoluted, but like kind of as a fuck you to Cuba with the whole embargo stuff. We wanted to take over the sugar industry. So we still give massive price supports <laughs> annually that Congress supports to keep us all addicted to that. While they also allow pharma to do whatever it wants, basically, which keeps us all addicted to that shit. Um, and like I've had three reconstructive wrist surgeries. Like I had, there's a cadaver bone after I broke this snowboarding in uh, Colorado a few years back. Three reconstructive wrist surgeries. So like there was like a metal plate, and, like 12 screws. Then they took them out, but there's a cadaver bone in here. And uh, I needed opioids. But what did I do? Because I know that I've been an addict. I was a coke addict when I was younger. I went and cut all my pills in half. And like, then I rolled a bunch of joints before each surgery. And so when the doctor said, hey, take this Oxycon on one surgery and then Percocets on another, they said, take one of these every four hours. I was able to cut my own opioid use in half just by eating half a pill. And then two hours later, smoking half a joint. And then two hours later, taking the other half. So literally me, former addict, was able to cut my own opioid use in half. And like, I was in a lot of pain. Like, I really needed something heavy like that. That's where, yeah, pharma has done some amazing things with vaccines. We're not going to get into that. But, you know, like, they've done amazing things medically. But also, fuck them. <laughs> fuck them for the <laughs> pharma. Yeah. Like, you know, it's both and. And that's yeah. where some politicians are like, no, it's all good. It's like, no, you can't paint people with such a broad brush like it's complicated fuck you pharma and thank you like you saved my life pharma you know it's both and yeah it's uh love and hate <laughs> yeah um i wanted to ask you about those hearings from uh the lady chair that is coming did you get an eta or some estimate of that because you What's told me that gillibrand was probably september but that's a different one with Arrow. What about this yep. other one? So Gillibrand, again, that Senate, mm -hmm. and then in the House, which the UAP caucus, Congressional UAP caucus, they're all House members. And so they're, well, so here, it's either they have to do September or else it's not going to happen ahead of the election because they're already, at the start of the year, they were slated to have, like annually, they have the all of August off. Um because it's really fucking hot in D.C. And historically, there was no A.C. in the Capitol, so it would get super stuffy. So, like, dating back hundreds of years, Congress has always had August off. These days, when there's an election year, Congress also gives itself October off. I'm like, you got, this is, like, set up to be the worst Congress, uh, like, in all history, um, when it comes to, like, passing laws. And some like Freedom Caucus members like push back on me for that. But I'm like, no, no, no. It was the chair of the Freedom Caucus, Bob Good. He was like, that's a bad barometer, just passing bills. But I'm like, sir, even in your efforts to unwind the administrative state, you guys have failed. <laughs> like, you guys can't even like cut spending um, because you're in such like partisan divide and like knives are out so much. So I'm like, no, by every metric, this is a shit Congress, uh, which is why some people kind of jokingly kind of nod or like, oh, better the less they're in session, <laughs> you know, because sometimes they do put the markets on a little downward spiral. But so that's where I think there'll only be three weeks in September where either the hearing happens in the House or it doesn't. Um, but again, so the last interview we put on Ask a Poll was with Congressman Moskowitz, Florida Democrat. And it's wild. Go on our site, askpoll.com, and listen to it. He, um, it's amazing. He's like, even in the midst, and 
the interview was a couple weeks back. So like it was before Kamala Harris uh, became the Democratic nominee for president. But the whole town, the whole nation, the whole world was looking and fixated on Joe Biden. You know, is grandpa going to die? <laughs> Shouldn't grandpa do his job, you know? And so everyone was fixated on that. Then the former President Trump assassination attempt. Like, boom, that became even people who don't care about politics and who, people who hated that man were hopefully like, no, you don't shoot an American president. We take him out of the fucking ballot box. <laughs> like, that's the American way. And so, like, all that stuff is just consuming everything in Washington and making everyone kind of just consumed with that. So we would think what Moskowitz says is in the midst of all that, the number one issue he's asked about is UAPs throughout the campaign. He's That's like, wild. When I read that, man, it? I was like, right? no way. <laughs> so that means that the interest Dude, and he's really is bullshitter. growing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a politician, but he's not a bullshitter. So yeah. I, I believe him. And he actually seemed a little bit surprised. Um, so, yeah, your audience, our audience at Ask a Poll, like it might feel like y'all are screaming into the wind but hey congress is taking note you guys have changed the conversation yeah and other people oh, that were not into them it. into the conversation that you've been yeah. having yeah and yeah. other people just regular folk are becoming way more interested recently on the topic yeah. uh, i've been asked a lot here in tijuana which is mexico but still yeah. it's it's a global issue it's not just america um i wanted to ask you also about uh, one specific photo that I'm going to put uh, as we speak that you uploaded uh, with you at a pub in D.C. Oh, this uh, guy? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I know this author. I'm going there. Um, so I know that you guys probably talked off the record 100%, but I can ask you a few circumventing questions. Uh, first of all, what was your impression of Lou Elizondo? Uh, when you Indeed. met him, great dude, genuine. Um, yeah, I think that's. And part of me is like Lou who. <laughs> <laughs> Turn out the picture, but no, that chat was off the record. He was in town. It's interesting because he had come, and this actually surprised me when I was interviewing. Uh, is it Ralph Norman? I always mess up his name because there was a former governor of Virginia, but I think it's Ralph Norman, South Carolina congressman, because he's a member of this group called the Conservative Opportunity Society, which, um, yeah, pardon me, Ralph Norman, the former Virginia governor was Northam. And I always, yeah, Ralph Norman. Um, but he is a part of this group, the Conservative Opportunity Society. That was the group that former Speaker Newt Gingrich back in the 90s used to like really, for one, Republicans use that group to recapture control of the House for like first time in 50 or so years from Democrats back in the 90s. And so this group is like a long legacy. It's like kind of, it's very conservative, but it kind of cuts across the spectrum because Norman, I think he's also a member of the Freedom Caucus. Well, so I was just talking to him and he was like, man, we just had this great, uh, session with uh, this guy, Lou Alessandro. And I was like, what? And so, Whoa. and this was like in the spring, I believe, or maybe early summer, but I think it was even April or something. Again, it's on uh, askapoll.com. But he was like, man. And like you said, like he got super engaged in the issue just after hearing Lou speak. We don't really know exactly what Lou told them all in there. Um, but I think that's where I think we're all kind of excited to see what's in his book. Um, have you ordered a copy? Yeah, I got the Audible one already. Uh, nice. Ready for ready for twentieth uh, because I love reading though, but uh, there's just not enough time to just stay focused on the book. So I like to multitask. And, right. But yeah, but well, uh, when you guys were there, like, did you get like a sense? Uh, did he give you tips on how to ask better questions? Uh, what was that uh, exchange like? Uh, and what was your impression right after, like, uh, based on what he's doing? Him and I, 
enjoyed nice cold Pacificos. Uh, my brother-in-law is half Cuban, half Colombian. So we talked about that a lot. Um, to answer your question, listen to askapoll.com. And if my questions seem a little bit better, uh, <laughs> that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> Does he have like this revolutionary spirit as the Cubans do? Um, he's just, he's got a genuine, uh, well, for one, he's a fucking badass. <laughs> like first thing you see is his goddamn arms and you're like, wow, he could snap my goddamn neck very quickly. <laughs> uh, but he's not like an intimidating figure at all, you know, which I just kind of love. Like he just seems like a cool, genuine dude. Um, who can take out a lot of people if needed. <laughs> <laughs> he's one not to mess with um we, he's supposed to be sending me a copy of uh the book and then we're hoping to have him on for me to uh interview him at askapool.com so stay tuned for that and that might answer some of your questions um because that's where all these folks and again this like taking it back to arrow this is why arrow fucked up so royally because their mandate from Congress and like Senator Rubio in one of our exclusives with him at Askapol, he was just kind of like so frustrated with Kirkpatrick when he's been on this like redemption tour in the media, you know, blah, 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 shitting on the issue. Like Kirkpatrick, shut the fuck up. Like you have no pedestal, to, like no bully pulpit to talk from. You were an utter failure. Like I think you were maybe even pushed out of Arrow. Because don't forget this, folks. We got all the interviews at Askapol. At the end of last year, before Kirkpatrick announced his like early retirement, um, Gillibrand met with him one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, Senator Rounds met with him one-on-one, -on -one, pushing him, saying, you're failing. All these whistleblowers say they don't trust you. They're, the whistleblowers who are supposed to be coming to your agency are coming to us and saying they don't trust you. And... And then it wasn't just Jill O'Brien and Rounds who had one-on-one -on -one meetings with Kirkpatrick saying that. It was also Senator Warner and Rubio, the chair and the vice chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee. When, I don't know if Kirkpatrick came to the Capitol. It seems like they might have went to his office. But the two of them literally were like, hey, you have to create an environment for these whistleblowers to feel safe. Um, he didn't. He utterly failed. And like, again, the spring Rubio was kind of like, man. and you could tell, because like senators, they got so much. Like they cover it, like education, local potholes, you know, like everything that happens in your state is on the lap of a U.S. senator. Where like a House member, they've got a smaller district, blah, blah, blah. So senators, they've got a ton of issues on their plates which is why they really empower their staffs and hire you know, really smart people to handle this issue, this issue. Sometimes they also set up agencies like Arrow because <clears throat> the issue, again, from the community, y'all made it percolate to the top. There's all these sightings of UAPs that they just can't, um, the government doesn't have a good answer for. So Congress set up Arrow and Rubio's like, man, why are you asking me these questions? He's like, that's why we set up Arrow. He's like, I literally, it's like they outsource their thinking on this topic to Arrow. And so senators are like, he's not just failing, or Arrow's not just failing whistleblowers, it's failing Congress because Congress wanted to wash their hands of this issue, you know, and present it to us in a way to like take care of some of the skepticism, answer some of the questions. It hasn't worked, you know, like the whole community is basically like, we don't believe anything Arrow says. Then whistleblowers are like, we don't trust Arrow with the secrets we want to tell. And so we'll see what happens with that. It'll actually be interesting if Gillibrand does have Arrow in for, um, you know, Kirkpatrick's replacement, Timothy Phillips, if she has them in to explain their methodology and then explain what they don't know. That's really going to be like, what, pardon my French, but like shit or get off the pot. Uh, because 
Arrow has a lot to prove, and thus far they haven't done it. Um, do you think? Do you think they're like this monolith, or, or the incompetence with, was just from Kirkpatrick, or do you think? Uh, do you think there's really good people in there? What's your read on 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 them as a whole? Because I've heard so, that people people want to. Uh, I've heard Professor, uh, Dr. Gary Nolan saying that they should be disbanded altogether. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? So I don't. I don't really know them much outside of Kirkpatrick and Phillips a little bit. What I've been so curious of, because it's interesting, like when I talked to Jim Himes, the top Democrat on um, the House Intel Committee, he's like, Arrow says this. They've like done away with all these blah, 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 UAPs, you know, and they put out their report. He's got like so much faith in them that it is laughable. Because um, I'm like, wait, you think one new tiny little government agency is literally getting all the information from every other agency? Like, government is a bunch of like fiefdoms and silos. And like the way different administrators in different agencies have power is kind of like through their secrets, through the stuff that only they have, that makes them powerful when it comes to like lawmakers or even flexing against another agency you know like this is our jurisdiction like this is our purview so like it blows my mind that someone like Himes just like believes Arrow I'm like wait Arrow they might um have all the secrets from the Pentagon might they might <laughs> but they probably don't <laughs> like literally there's a lot of people in the Pentagon and there's a lot of generals who don't know all the secrets. Uh, you know, the, again, the government siloed on purpose. And so then, let alone if we talk about Department of Energy, where Department of Energy is out at like Area 51 and other spots, you know, which members of the UAP caucus has pushed uh, the Secretary of Energy on for Chad and Luna. Um, and so, wait, does Arrow have any claim or jurisdiction over what the Department of Energy has. It seems like not. And so that's where I have a lot of questions about, I mean, because agencies wouldn't have subpoena power, but something like subpoena power where, like if you get a letter from the FBI or CIA and your Department of Education, yeah, you got to respond to that. You know, if you get a letter from Arrow, who? You know, yeah. and so that's where, especially knowing that senior Pentagon brass, for one, didn't want it, didn't think it was necessary, didn't think these issues were like worthy of talking about with the American people, or these issues were things that they should hide from the American people. Like it's one or the other. So like, just because Congress started this new group, you now think they know everything and have all the secrets and like, that's where Gillibrand, again, in this year's NDAA, was to look at our interviews with Gillibrand and Senator Rounds on this issue, because I asked him kind of point blank, like, hey, so uh, Gillibrand, her amendment last year to the NDAA was trying to smoke out kind of what Grush was saying. There's these SAPs, these hidden programs, uh, and her amendment like very explicitly said, if there are any programs that are using funding from this measure, uh, Congress has to know about them. You know, so they're trying to smoke it out. When I go back this year and like, hey, do you think that amendment worked? And both her and Senator Rounds, like Rounds said it so wonderfully. He's like, I, we don't know what we don't know. He's like, he's pretty certain that there are SAPs hidden from Congress, but he can't say it definitively because he's wise. <laughs> and he's like... We don't know what we don't know. And so that's where, thank God for your audience uh, and our audience at Ask a Poll, like Congress loves moving past these issues. And like the only reason it really got on their radar last year before Grush did his middle finger uh, to Congress um, in a polite way, but uh, before he blew the whistle, American airspace was invaded by... Uh, that Chinese balloon. And then after that, 
one balloon went from Montana to South Carolina. Then the Air Force shot down three objects in like three days to three different states. Media was like all over those incidents, you know, oh, missiles shooting. Oh, American media loves missiles. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we support the media or the military industrial complex because like if America's shooting, we like cover that and then we ask questions months later if we even ask questions. You know, we are terrible at what we do. So that's where these lawmakers like were able to quickly move on past all of that um, because, again, the media is so schizophrenic and just pops from stupid, you know, pop political story to pop political story. The beauty of Askapol is we don't let them forget. No. We remind them. And, dude, for the last year, each month, I've been asking people, hey, who gutted Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer's UAPDA amendment in last year's NDAA? And literally, no one uh, was able to answer that question. Like, even sponsors, co-sponsors of the measure, like Senator Rounds, the lead Republican uh, co-author with Schumer of the UAPDA, didn't know definitively who gutted Schumer's amendment, which is wild. He's the Senate Majority Leader. He's one of the most powerful people uh, yeah, in the world. Uh, he controls the U.S. Senate. Um, and his amendment was gutted. Did you, you know, ask Mike doors. Turner about this? He won't talk to me, but so I really <laughs> like Jim Himes, him and I know each other well. So this is where I'm curious. Himes told me point blank numerous times. He's like, no, UAPs never came up in NDAA talks. He goes, no, we're not doing any investigation, dot, dot, dot. So like, what rounds in our latest uh, Ask a Poll exclusive with him, what he said was what I've been looking for for a year. Because he's like, yeah, the people we're negotiating with now on Schumer's NDAA uh, amendment, the UAPDA, is House Intelligence. And so we've invited, I've invited Himes on um, Ask a Poll to do a live session with me. Because my question is, sir, either you lied to me or wait. You do not know what's going on in your committee. Did and he so have Seth to go on, on the show? I haven't really put my foot on the gas yet. But oh, man. I'm going to. Yeah, we'll see. I uh, Yeah, I bet he will. But, so we'll see. But the interesting thing is, I think so Himes either lied to me or I think what's more probable is he doesn't care about this issue. Like He thinks it's a non-issue. You know, he, oh, you know, you're looking at little green men, ha, 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 like roll his eyes. So if, because he doesn't care about it, and remember, Himes replaced uh, Congressman Adam Schiff. Schiff was kicked off the committee by uh, Republicans when they got the majority. So he was the chairman, got booted off. Like if Democrats win in um, November, Jim Himes becomes chair of HIPSKI, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. So right now, because he doesn't see it as an issue, he laughs it off. I kind of believe him when he says, I've never talked to, to Turner about this, which means Turner might be like super powerful and super empowered because he can go it alone. Where like if your ranking member doesn't care about the issue, but you come as the committee, you can flex and make it seem like Himes is there too. You know, use official letterhead, but because it's classified, uh, you know, it doesn't hit the light of day. No one's questioning it. And so, like, I'm curious if Turner cares about the issue or if one of Turner's uh, donors, you know, cares about the issue or not even donors, maybe one of, like, so each committee, there's different agencies that, are kind of the constituency for that committee. So what? FAA, you know, that the people on um, what, Commerce Committee, I believe. But anyway, like, the people overseeing that, like, hey, FAA, they're not going to come and talk to the Armed Services Committee. You know, that's the military committee. And so, like, all the armed forces, they lobby and fight for their issues with the armed services folks. And they 
need to maintain and establish good relationships with those lawmakers because they're very powerful. And so that's where I'm curious if there's some fiefdom in the federal government that really cares about the issue and has Turner's ear or whether it's the military industrial complex, you know, and the contractors and some of his donors who have his ear uh, or it honestly could be maybe he's got one staff member who cares about the issue. And if Turner doesn't care, we know Himes doesn't care. That staff member might be gutting Schumer's amendment to his face on behalf of an agency. And like, again, if Turner doesn't give a shit about the issue, but his committee's working on it, some of these chiefs of staff are more powerful than the lawmakers in this. I think Scott, let's Scott just remind town. let's just remind the people uh, where Mike Turner is a congressman from Ohio, and which Air Force Air Force base is in there? Right, Patterson. That's right. So, and he was there. What did we learn? It's on Ask a Poll. He was there with Speaker McCarthy last year um before mccarthy lost his job uh <laughs> due to a republican recession in the house yeah um but that was interesting because i'm like wait are they just not asking these questions or when they had a classified briefing at wright patterson did they see the jewels you know um even if there are no jewels in the jewel chamber, like what did you do at Wright Patterson? Did you go to every uh, facility there? Um, yeah, that's where I've been working on Turner because I used to interview him uh, regularly. I used to be the correspondent for uh, his local NPR station in Dayton, Ohio. And so he used to talk to me like 10 years ago. Like when I approached him last year, he was like, I don't do ambush interviews. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Ambush. Right. That's very telling, man. That's very yeah, telling. Right. But then you see him on Fox News and Newsmax. So like he goes to like the friendly spots to do interviews. I've been killing him with kindness because I've been like standing outside of the skiff for these uh UAP briefings or whatever. Um Turner will like see me and uh, instead of me like always oh, having a question for him. The last this is like methodical on my and I just go, hey, Congressman, how are you? And he'll give me like a hearty like, hi. And then he'll like catch himself like, wait, I'm supposed to scowl at you. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, no. I'm just treating you like a human being. So I've been like. That's good. That's good. I That's know. Good, so I think we're going to get an exclusive with him fairly soon here. Um, Let's hope. Yeah. Let's hope you do, man. This is where um, everyone out there, especially for any aspiring journalists, don't do what you see on CNN or Fox. Or like, no. oh, shouting the question, blah blah blah. Be polite. You're not gonna. You're not gonna kill them with kindness. Yeah. Five dimensional chess. That's the best and, advice you can give to any journalist. Uh, and formation. Um, I wanted to. The the main reason that I uh wanted you on the show again, is because I've seen you liking my some my, my smile. <laughs> Besides that. <laughs> I've seen you liking some of my uh my posts on yeah. the more the more deep cuts of this issue. And I know that you you're focused on Congress and asking politicians questions, but I wanted to ask you how deep you have gone on the subject, given that you're uh talking about it and writing about it all the time uh with your exclusives. Have you uh gathered some interest on any specific topics over the last few months? Dude, the beautiful thing about askapole.com is we're only going to be as good as our community. And our community is really fucking stout. Uh, like we've now got like about 4,000 subscribers, a handful of them paid. So you can subscribe for free. Then you get the audio. If you um, do the paid tier and support our work, there's some perks in it, but thank you for the support. Um, with that, like, in that group of 4,000, it's interesting because I'll see like, oh, mail.house.gov now following us. <laughs> you know, obviously not a paid subscription, but I'm like, wait, who's that a staffer for? You know, so like different agencies are watching us. Um, 
also, you will never know their names. I don't know their names. Um, but we have some amazing people who are current um, and former military who are feeding me some great questions. And I'm, I literally, we are your conduit to Congress. So you give us your questions. We bounce them off lawmakers. Um, and sometimes that debunks rumors. Sometimes that actually informs lawmakers. Oh, I never knew about that. Like, if you actually listen to our last Moskowitz interview at Askapol, I go up to Moskowitz and I, you know, he knows, like, these lawmakers, when they see me, they're like, oh, oh shit, we're going to we into our homework. <laughs> we're going to get another UAP question. And he's like, um, I'm like, hey, so that UAP hearing. And he goes, you got to talk to Luna. And I was like, no, 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 I just did. She confirmed it. Y'all are having a public hearing after August. And he goes, oh, good. So the first time a member of the UAP caucus heard about the UAP hearing in the House was we broke the news at Haskapol to the lawmaker. The first time all this, like probably 80% of U.S. senators, the first time they heard David Grush's name was when I asked him about it. You know, and so that's where I love it. You all, I'm going to my grave with lots of secrets. So I'm on all the encrypted apps, WhatsApp, um, Signal. I got my Proton Mail email. DM me or whatever. Get my info. Uh, if this guy trusts you, I trust you, so he can pass you my uh, contact. But yeah, through our community. I'm gaining a lot of knowledge. And because Congress and the government has been uh, so secretive, um, secretive to indifferent about the issue, um, sometimes there's just a quick debunking of a rumor, which is great. And people would be like, why are you asking that? Because it's good to have rumors debunked. To cross it out. <laughs> you know, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's where, like, get these folks to take us seriously. And because they've been so secretive and have pretended like there's no there there, even though they are secretive about, like, there's got to be something there. Uh, like, as we're chatting them, say, because, like, wait, why are they telling us this is bullshit, but they're protecting the bullshit? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Um, and so that's where, yeah. Even though it feels like oh, nothing's happening on this issue, like people are still writing it off, like there's a lot of progress being made. There's a lot of progress this community has made just in the past like three years. Congress has already had three public UAP hearings, first in the House in 2022 under Adam Schiff. Uh, I think Andre Carson hosted that or uh, chaired that hearing. Um, Remember, that was the big, like, first one in 50 years? Yeah. Well, then the next year you had Grush. Um, and then now uh, it seems like there'll be another one. And, like, three skiff briefings just in the 118th Congress. At least three on the issue. Like, yeah, this is definitely on many lawmakers' radars. And it'll be super interesting because Adam Schiff, he's running for Senate in California. He's basically the next senator from california unless like trump landslide like nixon wins like 49 states then we might not have a senatorship but it seems like we will senator schiff uh congressman schiff if he gets to the senate he comes in very respected by democrats remember he also led one of the uh trump impeachments so he'll have work to do with republicans who are gonna like treat him like the partisan hack that he kind of is um but he cares about this issue and so that's where it's been night and day between him and himes as the top democrat on the house intelligence committee i mean having a senator who really is passionate about answering these questions like he doesn't roll his eyes he doesn't have all the answers but he takes it seriously that we haven't seen that in the senate since harry reid and again, Schiff comes in with a lot of power. Yeah. Based on the things you've been told, including secrets, 
Do you have now like a better grasp or a better idea of what might be going on? So I, part of me, and this is where I've got a lot of questions and I always have more questions. Um, and let me put it this way. I cover Congress. I, Congress, constitutionally, I suppose, but like, they're always going to be inept. And because I interview, you know, I say I interview 535 liars for a living. Like, yeah, some of them I really trust, but they're politicians, you know? And so yeah. politicians are going to be political. So that's where the power of ask a poll is that, you know, our sources or whatever, or come, some are in the administration, some are in the military or whatever. They, them, and you all feeding us those questions kind of lets Congress know where to sniff sometimes, you know? And that's where, again, I don't think Congress, yeah, I don't think answers are really lying in, you know, uh, a, a room in the basement of one of the house office buildings, you know? So we as the community, to get our answer, uh, or to get our questions answered, we need Congress to be asking the right questions to the administration. And so that's where I don't think, you know, I'm not going to get a Pulitzer for like solving anything, but it's going to be kind of, it, it has been beautiful watching Congress kind of take the lead of our community and like, oh, sniff around on this thing, sniff around on this thing. Um, Cause yeah, according to like this Congress, well, a lot of the UAP caucus members coming out of some of the skiff briefings were like, oh, now we actually know some locations to look into. Um, so they're slowly gaining more knowledge and, you know, sharpening their questions. Because that's what they've said with Arrow. Under Kirkpatrick, especially, like, if you ask the question the wrong way, boom, you, they're just like, no. But, so you have to be very precise. And even I've messed up with some of our interviews where I... So what, Senator Gillibrand, I asked her when she had just gotten back from a Nevada trip where on her public schedule it said uh, classified meetings with Arrow, Northrop Grumman, and Lockheed Martin in Nevada. And when I first asked her about it, I was like, oh, so you, on that trip, did you guys discuss UAPs or whatever? And she's like, uh, it was classified. So, boom. So she can't talk about it. Literally five minutes later. So then she goes in and votes on the Senate floor. And remember, this is classified information. So yeah, some of these senators and House members, especially the Gang of Eight folks, you know, top of the Intel committees and like the Speaker and minority leaders, they should have the same knowledge that the administration does if they're asking the right questions. Um, but that doesn't mean the rank and file will know that stuff because they just have a higher top secret clearance or whatever. Um, and so that's where seeing Congress, or so anyway, with Gillibrand, I asked her about the classified trip and she's like, can't talk about it, it's classified. And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. You can go to jail if you talk about what happens in the skiff, you know, because it's classified. Five minutes later, she comes off the Senate floor and I was like, oh, you know, how was Nevada? So I didn't even have my mic on. But it's like, oh, hi, ma'am. You know, like, how was your trip? Um, she goes, oh, it was really good. And she starts talking about the stuff that she did in the classified portion, just naturally. But she wasn't like divulging classified information. But there was a lot of that information that she was willing to talk about when I came at it. When I didn't even ask a question. Conversationally. Like, but because I started the first question with, hey, classified, she's like, oh, can't talk about it. So that's where lawmakers, again, are learning. Because it, it's night and day. Like, um, sorry. But so that's where it's been interesting seeing lawmakers, for one, helping each other out, sharpening their questions. Um, but also kind of learning like, wait, maybe Arrow doesn't have access to this stuff or 
when uh, Burchett and Luna pushed the uh, energy secretary, like, again, doesn't seem like Arrow, their portfolio includes the Department of Energy. Um, and it, this all begs the question, how much power does Congress actually have over the contracting, the military contractors, you know, the military industrial complex. And so Congress, because they're finally, after 50 years, asking these questions, we're kind of seeing like this toddler Congress grow up in front of our eyes, you know, they might be at a second grade level now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, so send me that. Send me your responses. Askapoll.com. <laughs> where do you think? Where do you grade this Congress? Kindergarten, preschool, high school, oh, man. middle school? I know, right? Oh, where do man. you grade them? Where would you put them, bro? I would probably preschool. <laughs> no, probably elementary. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, I want to just to close out, man. Um, what do you think? Uh, is going to happen over the next couple of months in terms of the UAPDA. Do you think it will be gutted again, uh, based on what you've talked uh, to Congress people about? Do you do you have hope? Well, so this one is interesting because again, you know, this community, the UFO UAP community, uh, has given me like great questions throughout the year, like ever since. They wrapped up last year's NDAA. I've been asking about this year's NDAA. And for months and months and months, there is just crickets. Asking Senator Rounds, like, hey, is your amendment, like Schumer's amendment, are you guys going to like tweak it? Finally, after like six months of me asking, <clears throat> like I think May or June, he was like, yeah, it's come up and we're doing some tweaks. I was like, what? <laughs> so like... It was progress for them even to talk about it. Because like when the House did their NDAA this year, UAPs didn't even come up. Um, and like this, so the NDAA is the National Defense Authorization Act. The American military, like their presence is global. <laughs> like they are we're a fucking titan for ill and for good from our perspective. So like the every year Congress has to pass this authorization act. It doesn't fund, so they have to do a separate funding measure. This is the authorization measure. Like, we don't really know what would happen if it didn't pass. Like, would the military just, like, cease? I guess they wouldn't have orders from Congress. Uh, so, like, it just never happens. So, because it's such a must, must pass bill, um, like, Congress is willing to, like, shut down the government every once in a while, every, like, five, six years. I've covered Congress 18 years. I think I've covered five shutdowns. So, like, they're fine playing a little bit of politics with shutting, like, the uh, face of the federal bureaucracy down. They have not played with fire with allowing the military <laughs> to be unauthorized, which means, kind of like we're seeing, because, again, Congress is in the House. They're just going to be back three weeks before the election they have to pass the NDAA. To, like, on one level, that really empowers uh, party leaders and people with these fiefdoms, you know, because all the negotiations are, you know, every year, a portion of that bill is classified. So, like, there are already, like, secret conversations going on about it. And so it's going to be interesting. So when we I interviewed Senator Rounds, Two weeks ago, he was like, I actually think this, according to Rounds, and it, again, listen for yourself at askapoll.com, but Rounds was kind of like, you know what? I think we actually um, might get our UAP amendment and our tweaks. The Schumer amendment, we might get it in because the, he's like the House, they're going to send us their bill, and then in the Senate, they're going to have what's called like a manager's amendment, but it's like they're going to have their own package. And so they might like negotiations will already have taken place. But because, again, this is Schumer's amendment, it sounds like it is getting more of a focus than last year when this was like the first time in half a century that the issue like even, you know, came up.
in this uh, area. And so that's where it feels like Rounds and Schumer are like, all right, last year we started the conversation, uh, got the ball rolling. This year they're hoping to like get some tweaks in. Um, but Rounds thinks that they might. So again, this is where it comes up with the House intel. Rounds and Schumer, they're now negotiating with, it seems like, Mike Turner and his people or the people they represent in the Pentagon or wherever. So that's where Rounds thinks they're having better conversations this year. Um, and so, yeah, he says he's hopeful, but like not in like a, he wouldn't put money on it. <laughs> but he's like, there's a chance, you know, because of how convoluted this is and because there's not going to be like the democratic way of doing it where Senate passes a bill, House passes a bill. They're different. Then the two meet together and hammer out their differences. No, that schoolhouse rock stuff, that ain't happening. <laughs> this is going to yeah. be closed doors, in secret. But again, y'all, uh, especially any who are stateside, let your lawmakers know you care about the issue and that the more voices bringing it up at least puts it on folks' radars. Um, so yeah, it's, I'm very curious to see what happens. Because remember, y'all, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer's own amendment was gutted last year. That's wild. And yeah. so part of me is like, wait, did he allow that to be gutted? Like, was this just a PR move? You know, because that's you're the Senate Majority Leader. If you really are passionate about something, you can kind of do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then let me put this out there. 2024 politics and so you also have in the ndaa like abortion restrictions you know like social policy thrown in which happened last year which was kind of the first time because this used to be a nonpartisan issue house republicans last year put in some social policy i think some maybe some transgender like restrictions and abortion stuff that instantly um tied Schumer and Senator's hands because when they first started negotiations, they instantly were like, hey, these 10 provisions have to go. Well, so if you start negotiations and Senate Democrats are like, all right, these 10 have to go, but you know Republicans are really passionate about uh, you know, abortion restrictions and that, Schumer already like lost some power. So that's possibly how his amendment was gutted. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting now. Yeah, to see if Schumer cares about this baby or not. Yeah. Last couple of questions though, based on that, what you just told me. Um, because there's there seems to be a lot of uh discouragement uh because of how slow it seems to be going. I don't I don't think it is really. Um, you've told me that uh there's a lot of progress Fortis. being made, but it's not a hair. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to ask you though, um do you think based on what you spoke to Lou Elizondo about, do you think he's supportive of this government disclosure effort? Uh, or do you think he doesn't believe it can happen? It didn't we didn't really and it was, again refreshing like my Biggest takeaway from that was like, oh, I claim Cuban heritage because my godson, I mean, you know, my brother-in-law is half Cuban, half Colombian. Um, and so, yeah, I really enjoyed getting to know him as a person. We didn't get into the dot and tittle, um, but I think generally he seems like he's supportive of disclosure. Um, taking a step away from Lou, um, just broadly, it seems like, um, what was I going to say? But it seems like, well, let me put it this way. There's a lot, the UAP community has a lot of faith in this Schumer UAP DA <clears throat> amendment. I'm curious. I think Schumer sees it very differently. 
then the community sees it now. Oh. But that I just for him, it's yeah, I, he's fulfilling his promise to um, Harry, Harry Reid. That's okay. That's what his staff told me um, last year. Because oh, I asked point blank, hey, does this have anything to do with David Grush? You know, I even asked Schumer last year, uh, hey, David Grush, and he just like grimaced at me, uh, growled, but he knew Grush's name. Um, go listen to that interview and ask a poll. And so Schumer and the other co-sponsors told me last year that David Grush didn't come up at all in their talks. So it feels to me like Schumer and them Schumer's fulfilling his promise to Harry Reid because Harry Reid, former Nevada senator and majority leader, was very passionate about the issue. And so I'm curious, like, is there stuff in that text that the community, you know, the experts in the community wisely see like, oh, even if Schumer doesn't like give a shit about the issue and it's just like blowing smoke up Reid's dead ass, is he... uh accidentally passing something that could like actually give a sunshine dot 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 and that's where like the imminent uh domain uh eminent domain and then um some of the other provisions even like seeing the pushback and how it was tweaked and changed and gutted last year you're like all right did schumer carefully craft the amendment with rounds and it seems like they did because rounds told us the uh non-human intelligence or whatever there was like a debate about the language that they used and so it seems like they took it seriously that's where i'm curious the fact that they did negotiate it so much it seems like last year schumer and rounds and why did schumer lie down and let the house you know roll over him it might just be smart legislative strategy. Like last year, they cracked the door open. Boom. Once you get your foot in the door, oh, it's a lot easier to get your kneecap through the door. Oh, yeah. once you get your kneecap through, it's a lot easier to start getting some of your thigh through. You know, That's how up. legislation has worked yep. forever. Like, Yeah. And so that's where, remember, Schumer and Round did that colloquy. It's on askable.com. But I think last maybe November, September, November, no, somewhere, October, November, December, they did a colloquy when the NDAA was finally going through. And so it was still on their minds, like looking forward. And so I think legislatively, they can call it a win just passing that neutered version last year. Because again, now you're through. And what I say is like with presidents, once one president um like opens the door a crack and like drives a little prius through like watch out because the next president's gonna drive a fucking semi-truck through that same hole you know they don't like retreat and so once something like that is passed now they can go and say look this guy didn't fall last year hey now you had a year to think about it this is what we're trying to say with this and so Again, listen to rounds because he's like, we're having, it seems like they're having better discussions and negotiations than they did last year. Because last year, <laughs> rounds and Schumer's office, they didn't know because it was so convoluted, the process. They didn't even know. And I think they were genuine and not really knowing who they were negotiating against. Well, this year, rounds tells us it's House Intel. So, like last year, no one on the UAP caucus knew. So because no one knew where to take their questions, no one in the community knew to, hey, really pound on House Intel's door uh, and uh, Mike Turner's door. Um, they were given a cloak of secrecy last year that I uh, said, ask a poll, just pulled that veil away. And it turns out House Intel was the culprit. Man, that was good, man. Um yeah, a year. Well, it took me a damn year. Yeah. <laughs> I literally uh, did like 30 interviews. Some I didn't even like put out just because it was so depressing. Like, all right, they don't know. They don't know. And um, but just going down the list. Um yeah. You're the only one doing Fine. this, man. So god damn. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Matt, for being here. Um, I wanted to 
ask you if you could tease us with anything you got going on uh, over the next couple of weeks or something. Any new uh, interviews so, or exclusives? Yeah, we'll be dropping some new stuff. Um, nothing too groundbreaking, but not this coming week. The week after, I'll be in Chicago for the DNC, the Democratic Convention. We'll have Moskowitz there, Garcia. So hopefully, uh, yeah, I'll try to hit up Burchett, get some info on upcoming hearing, and then ask them about it and see. Can if you they, ask uh, him something for me if you get to talk to him? Yeah, what's that? Can you ask him uh, what if he could reveal to you something or anything that he spoke with Jaime Maussan because they met recently, uh, mm -hmm. and it would be nice if we could get his perspective on what he talked about with Maussan. Nice. Who met with him? Uh, Jaime Maussan with Burchette. Oh, Burchette. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. No, I need to touch base with him. Um, but then, yeah, we'll see. And hopefully also, hopefully at the Democratic Convention, I get Gillibrand and we get an update on uh, the Senate one. And again, this is one where that hearing might not happen except for I keep reminding her. And so she does feel a little indebted to the, and she feels like <clears throat> she takes the community seriously, <clears throat> even if she's really like pissed off too annoyed to like hurt the community's feelings. Cause she's like waffled a little bit, seems to knock the issue, but like, she does take you all seriously. She's just working at Senate speed. Um, yeah. You know, and, and she doesn't know what she doesn't know. And so that's where, Again, that's where it's going to be super interesting. Once, I'll write this time. I'm going to look for Adam Schiff on it too. At the convention, like having another voice of a senior Democrat um, who's seen as a serious lawmaker, even if Republicans roll their eyes, like, oh, he's a partisan hack. Like, he's good at being what he is. And I think in the Senate, he's going to grow up a little bit. Like in the House, you're supposed to throw bombs. Um, and he was kind of like one of Pelosi's like top attack dogs. So like he did his job. He's getting awarded with the Senate seat. Hey, bro, once you become a U.S. Senator, chill the fuck out. <laughs> Think a little bit. Like, you don't got to go on CNN all the time. Uh, like maybe, you know, read some classified documents. But I think it's going to be really empowering to Gillibrand and uh, Rounds and even Schumer Because right now in the Senate, you just again look at our list of all 100 interviews about David Grush with 100 senators. It's a depressing freaking list because like only 10 to 15 or like 20 had heard of him ish. Five to six were taking him seriously. The rest had like heard about him, but like look, either couldn't talk about him because classified or hadn't looked into him. Um, so again, having shift just there, uh, taking the issue seriously, or at least like, so this is interesting. Diane Feinstein, who he's running for her seat. She served like, what? I think she died when she was 89, longest serving female in Congress, uh, or Senator, whatever. She was just there for decades and decades. California Senator. I think like I looked all over the internet. Because I didn't want to like ask her something that was common knowledge. She came up with UFOs like a little bit, but it wasn't like I could not find her asked about the topic. That's where all these lawmakers have gotten a pass on these issues, which is where it's again interesting hearing that Moskowitz is uh, hearing from constituents on this. Like when they hear from their constituents, they're responsive to that. Even if it's like blowing smoke up your rear, like they, their constituents are their voters and they're nothing without their voters um, and their donors. But so that's where, yeah, it's, I think Schiff could really start a different conversation uh, in the Senate and I think kind of empower Gillibrand. Um, she seems like she's serious about the issue, but she also 
again, so she's on Senate Armed Services and Senate Intel. A lot of the other members on there that we've talked to roll their eyes at the issue. And so like, yeah. she has to walk and like, hell, we have to do this to ask a poll. People will like Himes will roll their eyes at us, um, which is where I have to like change my terminology and like meet them where they're at. Um, <clears throat> Gillibrand, these are her colleagues. You know, this is the Senate. Like, guys, even though this is a weighty, hefty topic, like, uh, what happened, like the war with uh, Israel and uh, Palestine, like, that's a big fucking global issue. Yeah. You know, there's unrest in the Middle East. Like, that should be pressing on every senator. And that's yeah. like people dying daily. Like, that's on their plate. People dying daily in uh, Ukraine. Ukraine. You know, yeah. and like, so there's, and this election, you know, if you believe the rhetoric of these politicians, like, November is going to like make or break America, according to them again. So that's where I think Gillibrand will get more space, more cover, more power once Schiff is there. And again, he came from, he was the chair of House Intel. Yeah. Like it's rare for a freshman senator to get a seat on uh, Senate Intel. But that's where Feinstein was. Like, there's a chance he goes instantly to Intel. Um, so, which could be a game changer. Could be. All right. Matt, well, thank you very much for being on, on the show again. I hope we can do a round four later yeah. this year. I mean, maybe ever. maybe if, if a hearing happens in September, we can oh, schedule yeah. something right after. That'd Done. be cool, right? All Done. right, man. All right. Uh, thank you, Matt. You have a great weekend, man. And uh, please Appreciate visit yeah. askapol.com. Uh, subscribe to askapol.com. He's doing the most important work on the UAP topic in Congress. So please, guys, go visit Askapol. And he has all the exclusives. Feed us your questions. Yeah. I don't know who you are, but find me on Signal WhatsApp or just DM us. But uh, like on our subscriber chat, feed us your questions because there's so much power in your voice. Like, yeah. I'm the media. They roll their eyes at me. When I come and I say, hey, someone is asking you this, there's power in that that I just don't have because fuck the media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Okay, Matt. Take care, man. Thank you. Uh, later, see bro. you later, guys. Take care. Appreciate you, boss. Bye.